Moderating our next panel, Artist Survival and Revival, is Dr. Mei Ray, a native of Shanghai, China. She began her piano studies at the age of three and was accepted into the Shanghai Conservatory of Music just three years later. May gave her first solo recital at the age of 10 in front of an illustrious audience that included the President of Austria at the Hofburg Imperial Palace in Vienna. She has performed in some of the most prestigious concert venues in the world and was inducted into the Steinway Teacher Hall of Fame in 2020. May Ray was praised by the Boston Globe as a riveting virtuoso and by Boston Musical Intelligencer as a concert artist with deeply felt and intense musicality. She's performed to critical acclaim in the United States and abroad, including a recent performance of Rachmaninoff's Concerto No. 1 with synchronized live projection of her fMRI brain scans during the performance. A graduate of Yale University, Yale School of Music, and Stony Brook, she holds duo degrees in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, as well as music. As a music and medicine research scientist, she has been appointed assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at Houston Methodist, assistant professor at Weill Cornell Medical College, and visiting assistant professor in organic and general chemistry at the Sophie Davis Biomedical School at the City University of New York. In April of 2020, Dr. Ray founded the Music Care Initiative in collaboration with the Houston Symphony to bring small doses of human connection and musical healing in the form of live bedside concerts to isolated ICU patients, as well as physicians and nurses suffering from acute and chronic stress and burnout. To date, the Music Care Initiative has brought over 400 live bedside concerts performed by numerous illustrious artists, including Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe. May is also a Yoga Alliance certified Baptiste and Bikram instructor, Patty certified scuba diver, and we're grateful to have her here today. So let's begin by taking a look at May's initiative, Music Care, and the direct impact of music on healing. I was talking with the patient to see if he was ready to participate with me with physical therapy. Um, and the patient was saying, I can't, I can't do it right now because Yo-Yo Ma is going to come and play for me. They're going to have a concert for me with Yo-Yo Ma. And I was just thinking to myself that this patient is very delirious because <laughs> how is Yo-Yo Ma going to be coming to play for him here? Um, only to find out then that, of course, Yo-Yo Ma was coming to play for him. spirits up but it helps us as nurses you know you're surrounded by alarms and patients who are very sick and critical but to have um, just such a talented person and so sweet just providing his artistic gift is something that I'll probably never forget it was one of the greatest things ever thank you guys oh, oh, thank you <laughs> thank you during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic the Center for Performing Arts Medicine launched these bedside concerts to bring world-class live music and a small dose of comfort and musical healing to patients and healthcare providers at Houston Methodist Hospital. Concerts, you know, they provide a different dimension to the healing process 
it's not just physical healing, but it's the enrichment of the the soul and uh, the spirit. So I appreciate these artists and Methodist Hospital for for considering that and in putting that into their practice of medicine. Good afternoon and welcome to those of you who just joined us. The theme of our discussion this afternoon is artists, survival and revival. During our discussion, I want to welcome and invite you to send us any questions or comments that you may have. And thank you, Suhail, for the introduction and for showing the music care video. Um, it's been a very meaningful and impactful experience founding the program and connecting with local as well as remote artists. And it's been just incredible having them donate their time and musical gifts to these very vulnerable populations that are prone to acute stress, isolation, and just generally deprived of um, a sense of normalcy and beauty and human connection. So it was also, it was equally meaningful for the for the patients as well as the physicians and nurses who were able to benefit from the live um, bedside concerts as well um, as it was for the musicians. And many of them shared um, that they were really appreciative and they were they felt the immediate impact, the positive change they were able to make um, just in that instant while many of them were deprived of the chance to connect to a live audience in a concert hall, which for a musician is equivalent um, as many of us can feel, it's a kind of uh, taking fish out of the water. It's our oxygen. And and so I, I just want to give you a little bit of background um, information of what I did and behind creating this program. So I remember in March last year, like many of us, I played my very last live concert in front of a live audience. And since then, we've had to find many different ways, creative, unconventional avenues to connect to our audiences and sustain our art and our livelihood. So um, while I was at Houston Methodist, I was spearheading a few music intervention, human subject clinical protocols uh, as a faculty member in the Department of Surgery. So my research seeks to investigate um, physiological and neurological mechanisms and pathways from using defined and specific um, music intervention in different cohorts. So both patients um, and as well as healthcare providers prone to burnout, especially during the pandemic, um, stress, sleep deprivation. So we used fMRI imaging um, as well as other scientifically rigorous um, tests like inflammatory and stress biomarker analyses to gather data that music can and should be used as a medicine, as medication. It's a lot more than something that just makes us feel good. So that, um, and that there's nothing elitist or exclusive or inaccessible about classical music in particular. From the um, my colleagues I've worked with, many of them very well educated and uh, many of them surgeons, as well as the patients we provide music to, a lot of the times there was a sense of uh, misconception about the classical music genre. So um, as a musician, it was rewarding for me to be able to demonstrate using, um, using data, using evidence that, that is not the case. So, um, and what initially drew me into the field of music medicine was that, um, so as a concert artist, we have intuitively known for a long time uh, that music can heal, it can rejuvenate, and it can connect us in a universal and immersive way that transcends nationalities, transcends our personal, cultural, religious differences as human beings. And as a researcher, I had the opportunity to, to collect scientifically rigorous data uh, in a wide range of cohorts so that um, my personal hope is that one day doctors will be able to go on PubMed 
which is um, where all the peer-reviewed um, publications uh, you can find, and search for very specific pieces or types of music they can use to treat, for example, sleep disorders, dementia, depression, um, and instead of going for the pharmaceutical route, which can carry a lot of uh, negative effects or risks, instead of reaching for an ambient um, or other drugs, um, a patient may just be prescribed to listen to some um, the aria from the Bach or the variation, or some slow movement from a Mozart symphony, or some Chopin nocturnes as the first resort. So um, now I want to introduce our wonderful three very special panelists today. Um, and before I do that, um, let me see if we have any questions from the audience. So during the COVID pandemic, um, many concert artists and performing arts organizations have encountered particularly catastrophic challenges and unprecedented hardships during the last 25 months things concert halls around the world shut down. And many of my colleagues and friends, for example, my friends at the Met Opera in New York, they lost their livelihood and for some of us, financial stability and even our home. So taking this concert stage away has been tremendously difficult, both on the professional and the personal level. And as a result, even for those of us who have managed to survive by reinventing our livelihood through virtual concerts, um, virtual teaching, and other avenues, the pandemic has taken a, a devastating toll on artists' mental health as well. Now we're finally starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel as with increasing prevalence of vaccines and testing capacity, the concert halls are starting to reopen. And Maestro um, Sebastian Lenson, he, you'll be conducting your first concert back in San Antonio next month. I know you've been conducting other areas of the world, even during the pandemic, but we're really excited to have you um, back in Texas. And artists and audience alike will be able to live and breathe the same music under the same roof again. So we're all very, very excited to see that happen. So I want to first welcome um, our first guest, Maestro Sebastian Long Lesson, who has been the music director of the San Antonio Symphony from 2010 to 2020. And from 2004 until 2011, he was music director of the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra. He regularly appears with the leading opera companies of the world including those in Paris, Hamburg, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Washington, Oslo, Copenhagen, and Stockholm. His operatic repertoire is exceptionally wild, wide, with 75 works ranging from Baroque to contemporary. So Maestro, just personally, I've had the privilege of meeting you when I played um, for the opening ceremony in the 2000 and 20 um, Gurwitz competition that was renamed from the San Antonio competition. And incidentally, my last international trip was to Australia, to Tasmania, and it's become uh, my family's actually favorite place. And we really want to go back there and hopefully attend one of your concerts there one day. So welcome, um, Maestro. What has the last year been like for you? And um, would you share with us any creative, unconventional, different way you use your music to connect to an audience during this time? Well, it's a very complex um, uh, field and question. I think that everybody uh, went in very various different directions. Um, my stop was actually fairly brief um, after it stopped in March. Um, the first weeks were actually kind of... Um, an introspective uh, challenge. It was actually kind of a cleansing uh, at first because, you know, I went all of a sudden I had time for things I've never had time for, like playing the piano, for example. So what really saved me was Schubert and and the wonderful Bursendorfer that I had on loan in my house uh, from, from very 
wonderful patrons. So that was actually all very welcoming. And then we did a lot of uh, streaming um, initiatives with the orchestra. I, I conducted the finale of Mala Nine, uh, Mala Two, actually, with a virtual orchestra, virtual chorus, virtual solos. Everybody was connected. It was a crazy experience um, because I was basically conducting in the silence into silence and hoping that 200 people are able to follow that. <laughs> um, the outcome was actually quite extraordinary. Um, then I started a, um, a website uh, for virtual teaching with a lot of my soloist friends, actually um, JP Joffre is on that as well. Um, and, and many great pianists and, 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 and string players. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing. The best thing about it was reconnecting with all of them. Um, so that offers the opportunity to, to teach online for them and, and have accessibility to artists that are not touring anymore uh, for young students. So that was one of the things. Um, and then I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And, and from September on until the end of the year of 2020, I, I worked in Korea uh, where I'm music director at Korean National Opera. Um, and, and we did actually, we did a Fidelio production um, with a virtual connection to New York with uh, my friend Kibok Murat, who actually delivered the, uh, the set and projected set that he was drawing live uh, from New York. And it was projected into Seoul into the theater. Quite an extraordinary experience. And then we went on the national tour did La Bohème, I conducted the KBS. And so I was actually living in Korea quite a normal life until everything there got slowed down a little bit, but not too much. And um, now I'm again in another vacuum, which will be hopefully will, will end in May because I'm going back to Europe tomorrow and I will conduct in uh, Budapest for the for the festival there with the Hungarian National Philharmonic. Actually, funnily enough, a work with, uh, by J.P. Joffre, the double concerto that he wrote for the Hungarian uh, cellist Istvan Bardai. Um, and I have another piece that I combined. I'm doing a combination of Tristan and the Elgar cello concerto in one block that we are going to premiere in, in Budapest on in May 10. So, I have to say, yes, there are some vacuums here and there. Um, and of course, I mean, we lost, we all lost a lot, enormous amount of, of income and still do. Um, but I felt actually very privileged that I had outlets here and there. And the quiet times in between sometimes can be also very cleansing um, and very healing because, um, Sometimes, you know, we also in a treadmill of uh, and running and running, especially when you travel a lot, uh, the self-reflection is missing, you know, we're constantly performing for an audience and to, for a musician to come back, uh, it was for a forced sabbatical for a lot of musicians. But that can have a creative uh, impulse as well, to see it from the positive side. Thank you for sharing all that. You have done an incredible amount of um, work during the pandemic. That's, that's amazing. And um, now I will introduce our second guest, soprano Mane Galoyan, who had her debut with the Metropolitan Opera in New York last season. So she has performed lead roles in opera houses around the world and garnered prizes in numerous international competitions including first prize in the Eleanor McCollum competition and concert artist, Concert of Arias with Houston Grand Opera and third prize in the 15th International Tchaikovsky competition. So welcome, Mane. So we just heard um, Maestro's um, introduction of what the last year has been like for him. Would you share a little bit with us what you have been up to? I know you have been traveling a, a, a bit as well. Hi, hi everyone. Um, it's good to see you all and good to reconnect with um, friends around the world through musical bridges around the world. 
And uh, actually, it's very um, ironic because one of the creative things that I did uh, during the pandemic, <laughs> which lasted instead of one month, uh, it lasted forever, uh, was with uh, musical bridges around the world. <clears throat> and uh, we had this um, <clears throat> concert, uh, which was uh, live and it was virtual. And um, I was lucky enough to be quarantining with my husband, who is a conductor, but he also plays the piano. So we made some recordings and it was live with musical bridges. And uh, another thing that was very interesting was uh, one of my artist friends, uh, Masha Kerian, she's also Armenian, but she's based in Boston. She asked me if we could collaborate and um, create something, and if uh, it would be uh, interesting for her to create a painting while I performed. And so <clears throat> we decided that I will perform Armenian pieces because um, Gomitas is never performed a lot. So, and I wanted to introduce it to my Instagram public. And uh, Masha, my friend, uh, while I was singing, she had the sketch, but she was uh, painting and drawing while I was uh, singing and performing, um, inspired by the music. So the colors were inspired uh, by the music, the her the way the style that she did the painting was in style, in, uh, inspired also by the music. I have a little card here that she sent me. She made the painting to a card and sent it to me. <laughs> so <laughs> Um, and another thing that I loved doing during the pandemic was uh, singing uh, concerts for the family. My husband and I performed for his family a lot because we had that urge to perform and they loved it. So it was wonderful to perform for our loved ones who also loved it. Very fulfilling. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I, I agree with uh, home co concerts. I'm not sure if you did yours from home or not. Yeah. Also, um, some for me also to play for for either patients or my extended family in different city just from um, my studio here has been a lifesaver sometimes just to go through very um sometimes very simple repertoire i wouldn't normally approach i was looking at my programming from the last few years is they were usually larger works more com convoluted complex works but to have the time to just flip through some chopin nocturnes or um, schubert impromptus and and then have someone tangible there watching and to be able to connect. That's been very meaningful. Um, thank you for sharing. And now I would like to connect the audience, connect you to our third guest. She is a superwoman, and her name is Christina Pato. She's a world-renowned um, Galician backpiper, uh, a pianist, an educator, a producer, and just an all-around incredible human being. So thank you so much for joining our panel today, Christina. Would you share with us, um, was, was there any particular self-care ritual that sustained your sanity during the lockdown? Or was there a piece of music or an experience that brought you relief or escape um, during this time? Thank you, May, and thank you, Manny, and thank you, Sebastian, and thank you for this beautiful journey about everybody's life during this year. And thank you for, for the introduction. As a little bit of context, my work is in between disciplines. As an educator, I've been lucky enough to be able to continue that part of my life, which is my passion and is very much connected to what you do, May, because right now I'm working with uh, Professor Lisa Wong at the Mind Brain Behavior Initiative at Harvard University. And we put together a class that is called Creativity at the Edge, uh, Music, Health and Community, in which we explore all these beautiful programs on the intersection between the, the arts and the sciences, but also 
also we help our students, which are mostly neuroscientists and, and psychology majors, to, to see that most of the time those divisions between disciplines and between the arts and the humanities are, are way more, uh, way less visible than we think they are. So um, during this year, it has been a unique uh, moment for me as a as an artist, because I was already on a transition myself uh, from a full-time career of touring. And as Sebastian was saying, was like, of, of like feeling that I was running from place to place, especially uh, through my solo career, but also with Silk Road and Yo-Yo Ma. And um, it was maybe a couple of years or maybe three years before the pandemic when I started to transition to a different kind of path in which my learning programs or my way of understanding the role of the arts in education uh, was going to take the center of my time and the center of my attention. So I was hoping that this year during the pandemic, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, I had all the, all the energy in the world. I was kind of, uh, okay, this is what it is. Uh, everybody's on the same situation. These are... Um, strange times for all of us but at least we are here and we are alive and there is food on the table and there is a home and there is a roof over me so why should I be complaining and uh, and that kept me going for like six or seven months and mostly because I was teaching at NYU another class and then I was preparing the, the Harvard class but um, then all of a sudden maybe January or February, I had like another cycle of I don't see the light. And, and that was fascinating because for those of you in San Antonio who have seen me perform or who has experienced my energy, uh, I always consider my energy something like natural to me. Like it was kind of like I took it for granted and all of a sudden it disappeared. And um, I started to question what exactly was the reason behind it a year into the pandemic already and um, and I am um, still in that process I'm looking for the right way of using my talent on a responsible way but without having to go back on the road because that kind of life after 23 years I think is enough and um, and that's where I am right now so I'm putting my energy into creating my next class and my next project for the University of California in Santa Barbara which is also with another neuroscientist and um, and then also I'm trying to write a novel I've been a writer all my life uh, mostly like short stories and columns for the newspaper in Spain and um, I thought that maybe creating somebody else's life or recreating somebody else's life in paper made, might be a way of healing my my own process and still here we are I mean we're incredibly fortunate and grateful and 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 we can have this conversation and that should be enough to keep going but sometimes it's not and you can't you can't question that too much if not you get into this spiral of of noniness many of us can relate um of hitting a roadblock you know a few months for some of us the, the timeline may be different and be three four months into the lockdown for me it was uh, also actually incidentally it was also towards uh, about the beginning of the year and mid january it was just um we, we weren't able to see the end and um but if um, I have another question for her, I guess I'll ask you, Mane. Uh, what, if you had known how long we'd been quarantined or how long this pandemic would, would last, was there something that you would have done differently if we had a better perception of an um, idea of the time frame for this whole ordeal? Yes, I would work out more in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, and going back to what Christina was saying earlier, you know, as, even as um, a previous yoga instructor, I had lost during moments, you know, the, the depletion of the feeling of energy, just feeling uh, empty and feeling our creative juices not there anymore on some days. You know, I, I, I find it hard to exercise or even to do a vinyasa routine, which would have never, ever happened um, in the last decade of my life. And uh, so Maestro, um, was there a, any friendship or personal relationship that helped nourish you musically? You shared a lot with us 
what has happened um, professionally for you and your world travel, your conducting career. Was there any special friendships um, that you have formed while you were there? Yeah, uh, well, definitely. I mean, uh, of course, you know, the artists you work with, um, yeah, almost ever, all the time, I think you start a new friendship uh, uh, when when you connect artistically. So so that was very nourishing in in in, in South Korea. Um, I made a lot of new friends there and and. Uh, and met a lot of wonderful people um but it was for me it was really important to reconnect and and to find the artists that have over all the decades built up a, a long-term relationship and have seen over and over again um and i i remain in st steady exchange even if you know as we know you know don't make plans far in advance because everything might change and the concept that you plan for in that's supposed to happen in four weeks might not might never happen um but the constant exchange with my friends and for example working with jp on this double concerto that he's um that we will premiere next next month all of these things i think help help me very much through through this time of isolation i mean i'm an extrovert i nourish off people's energy um so i need that um, but it's also very, very good to rely on yourself sometimes. Um, so it's a give and take. The good thing is, I think, to come back to your question before, it's, it's great that we didn't know how long it would last, you know? Because when I entered, for example, my first quarantine in, in Korea and I knew it was going to be two weeks, I freaked out. In the first day, I freaked out because two weeks seemed very long. But when I was a week into it, it seemed very normal. Um, I think not knowing how long it lasts is is heal is very good psychologically because it would have caused an enormous panic, um, more than than we already had. I actually agree, and this is a silly anecdote. But I remember the first time I ran. I'm not a runner in. In any means, the first time I was forced to run a 5K, uh, post-Thanksgiving 5K, I remember my, my, um, my husband tricked me. You know, every corner I would ask how, how, how much is left, and he wouldn't tell me. He said, we're, we're almost there, almost there. And then that's what got me through it. But if I had known exactly how I felt or how long it would really last, I wouldn't have made it. So I think that's true for a lot of difficult or traumatic. That's my hiking, my hiking <laughs> technique with my daughter. Oh, it's not far. It's not far. You know, and I know it's a it's a five hour hike. <laughs> right. It's the only way to get through stuff like that. Yeah. And um, so if you know, once we return, well, hopefully in the near future, once everything returns to, to uh, normal, <clears throat> what are some um, of the top items on each of your to do list? Maybe we'll start with um, Christina. It could be either personal or professional or anything in between. Well, I think for me, the most important thing, and I think for all of us, is to understand that we're not going back, right? We are, we're moving forward to whatever it is that is, that is normal in the next step of, of our lives. And that's, that was, for me, a very important lesson during this year. Like, we were maybe, and that was connected to the hope I was talking about at the beginning, and also to the idea of energy, right? Like, in the very, very early months of the pandemic, you were hoping to go back to normalcy or to some sort of normalcy. But we don't know how much this is going to affect our lives in general, uh, not to mention our lives as artists or not to mention our audiences, the ones that will pay to come to a concert hall and to share the air and the space with other human beings. I, it already takes time to feel okay. I mean, at least for me, just to go to the supermarket or, or just even like thinking about going um, to have dinner out with my husband. So that that's for me a very important step that we should all think about what is 
what is normalcy, how does normalcy look like in the post pandemic uh, era, which I think is a very important thing because it will help us understand our own expectations about what it means to move forward. And then on a personal level, um, thinking about my own practice and the way, um, and I take this from my mentor, Yo-Yo Ma, and his uh, idea of the edge effect as that point where two ecosystem meets and what, the kind of diversity that happens. And um, I keep, I will keep trying to nurture my practice as a teacher and also as a learner and um, and that's mostly connected to the environments that I was already working with mostly with the Silver Ensemble and at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Wonderful and what about you Mane? Anything? Um, it could be a very small thing you're looking forward to doing without being, you know, even now I, I, I'm vaccinated, I still get very paranoid when I go to the supermarket. Like, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to going to the restaurants. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and um, Sebastian? Um, you know, it's very interesting. I and I, I talked to a lot of people about it. Um, when when it first started, it said about think really clearly about about the people you miss and about the people you don't miss. And with everybody I talk to, is the people you miss are way outnumbered by the people you don't miss. It sounds very harsh, but I think we become all much more focused on what's valuable in our time. So when we want to spend time with people again, we be we are very more select, much more selective of our uh, of our valuable time and about our personal relationships that are meaningful. Uh, when it comes to restaurants, it's the same thing. I mean, there there will be a lot of places I will never go back because. The cooking at home ten times surpassed the capacity of satisfying, uh, uh, satisfying that. So uh, it'll be very challenging um, to come back. But one thing is is um, is very clear to me: in our performing world, all the live streaming on all of that hit a wall, <laughs> uh, hit a giant wall, um, and it is actually for me a very positive thing that I see that it doesn't have a big response anywhere anymore. People wait for the live performance. Uh, when you ever go to a live stream, it's the numbers are small, are very small. Um, that's not because people are not interested. Interested people need the live performance at some point. And um, that's where we're gonna see um, hopefully a big wave of new interest um and new energy energy you know also from the audience and from a researcher's perspective there are already some data showing um a profound pr profound differences you know, physiologically when you compare a live performance and versus a recorded performance of the same repertoire of course just artists that's very intuitive but it's nice to have um research backing it up to encourage people to um when it's safe to do so to go back to concert halls now I'd like to take a question. Um, there's some wonderful questions coming from our audience today. So um, one is, as performing artists, what do you anticipate or envision to be uh, the biggest challenge challenges when once we return to to performing live under the same roof as our audiences? Um, how about Christina? Would you like to? Uh, Leaders on this question? Yeah, I was also reading through the questions uh, in here, and I was, I somehow I was uh, very interested in another one too, which is the one of uh, none of you were born in the U.S., but you all have lived your life here. Um, related to the place where you were born, how are the arts valued? And I think I'm going to combine both because I spent 
the last year jumping from New York and Galicia. Uh, my mother suffers from frontotemporal dementia and I tried to be as much time possible in Galicia with her. So I was lucky enough to be there for like six, seven months last year. Uh, and then I had to return to the US with my husband and I was here for like four or five months. And uh, it, it was just fascinating to see how differently the approach was to live performances, uh, mostly because in Spain, although uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, the restrictions were incredibly, um, <laughs> incredibly strong. Like we, at some point we even had like military on the streets just to make sure we were not leaving our homes, right? Like it was really a different kind of approach than the one I've seen in New York. But then, curiously enough, uh, the performing arts kind of restarted to open very early in, in, in the pandemic, like in the summer. We already had live performances, of course, keeping like safe distance and with all the, with, with all the right conditions uh, to avoid the spread of the virus. But um, there was some sort of, some sort of um, live performing life <laughs> uh, happening in Spain and it has been going on for the whole year which is fascinating because the case of New York is the opposite so it makes you think a lot about the way the arts are subsidized or supported in one part of the world and the other you know like here in the US um, this is also an industry it's a business so wh what is the point of, about having a theater that only has like 20% of the seats open like how much revenue do we get from that but then in Spain or in, in most of the European countries countries, uh, that is in a very high percentage subsidized by the government. So the idea of having a theater with only 30% capacity, it actually it what it actually gives us a lesson on, on why the arts matter. So I've been trying to verbalize what is the best way of approaching it because it, either one or the other is not an option, but there has to be a way in between in, in which we don't find the arts as an industry, but as you may may you know well uh, the arts as a form of healing and also the arts as a way of bringing the community together and and the economic system of supporting the arts in Europe is very different but somehow it covers that particular that particular corner and as a musician myself I come from two completely different realities I am a Galician backpiper that means like popular music, folkloric music, like the bagpipes were instruments and are instruments that are that were designed to bring people together somehow, right? Uh, to, to create community. And, and as a pianist, I was trained as a classically um, collaborative pianist and I went through the path like all of you in here. And I always found it fascinating that as a bagpiper, I will come to the square where people are and I will play for them and try to fulfill whatever is the feeling of the day, if it is a funeral or a, or a party. But as a pianist, I will go to the stage and I will wait for people to come and see me and maybe pay a ticket for that. And uh, I think, in the moment we are right now, those questions are more relevant than ever. What is the kind of music uh, environment that we want to have to heal the community? And what is the kind of support that we all need to be able to, to have that particular, that particular environment in which the arts, classical or pop or folkloric or whatever, are accessible to everybody. And even if you don't have those whatever hundred dollars that it may take you to get into the Metropolitan Opera or to or to Carnegie Hall how how do we make that open and how do we create that kind of access that you were talking about at the beginning of this panel um, uh, open to everybody even the people that is suffering the most the the ones that maybe maybe don't even think about um, about the healing powers of, of the arts Thank you. And um, Sebastian, do you have anything to share with us um, regarding the topic? I, um, I, I actually totally agree with Christina. I think um, what will happen, uh, whether it will happen today or in a, a year from now, is something that must happen in the United States, a completely change of funding models, we find. Um, we are relying way too much on ticket sales a bigger percentage than any any other part of the world in our 
funding relies on ticket sales and private funding and almost on very, very little on, on government support. That will change. And basically, to be quite honest, it has already changed because um, orchestras have been seen as, as small businesses. And, and even in the case of the San Antonio Symphony, part the, the salary has been paid by the PPP money like it was for other companies. So we have seen already in government um, role in financing the arts. And I don't see a reason why that should not continue long-term. So something like that, like we are seeing in New York does not happen, uh, that people are laid off in the middle of a pandemic, uh, which didn't happen in other industries, uh, those severe, or in other parts of the country. Um, and if you think about that, we are subsidizing airlines with billions of, um, of taxpayer monies. I don't see a reason why not doing the same thing uh, with our arts organizations right now, because to come out of this pandemic, it will take a lot of money. And, and we have to face the fact that people might have less money to spend high ticket prices or might also have less money available to donate, which hopefully today for Musical Bridges won't be the case. And um, we raised a pretty penny here, but everybody would agree that part of our taxpayer money should be allocated to the arts um, and to the livelihood of musicians uh, in general to support the creative class. Um, not only through the pandemic. The pandemic is an excellent, an accelerator into something that happened before. I said that to another friend of mine in the music industry, I said, we are the JC Pennies uh, of the arts. Uh, that was a business model that wasn't quite working before. And now we know it won't work if we keep it like before or try to rebuild before. We need to find a radically new different way of, of funding models. We must. No other way. Do you think shifting to a more uh, government-centric model, could that impact uh, artistic programming or integrity or control of, of the organization itself, of the artists? I ask that because, you know, I, I, where I come from in Shanghai, I yeah. know that a lot of the, for example, when I, going back to the very first Rosetto, I played in Austria, I had to go through, I had to get my program approved, I had to include one nationalistic a piece on the program. So I know it's different in other parts of Europe and around the world in America for sure, but do you think that may have, what kind of impact it may have to, if that shifts in that it, direction? Actually, I think it will have a very positive impact. I mean, um, I don't think that government is controlling uh, the, the programming. I mean, in your case, I can, and I can understand it as well, you know, um, that would be the same here. You know, you want to represent your country when you tour. That's fine. I, I think um, I don't, I've seen it in Europe. There is basically really no government influence on programming whatsoever. And when it happens, it usually becomes a huge scandal. But I, I can assure you, you know, when you have a board meeting, you have people telling you what you should program or who you should hire because they give money to it. That influence is quite outspoken and direct. Uh, so with the government, that would be very complex and I think would be kind of, diff I think we will see actually a more liberal way of, uh, I, I didn't feel uh, restrained here either, but I don't, I don't see a danger if the government gets involved. Okay. It is, I mean, it could, it could actually go both ways because, you know, what I, from my experience in Spain as a producer of festivals is, is also the fact that most of the cultural events in Spain are free and open to the public also creates a, a different kind of relationship with the value of the arts. So I always find it, I mean, I always find it fascinating to, and I struggle with finding something in between the model of Europe or at least of Spain or in my particular corner of Spain, uh, the Galicia government, to find that balance in between the culture being totally subsidized by the government, which 
you know, even if it is a very subtle uh, suggestion, there is always some sort of mission behind all the programming that goes around, even if it is subtle and it comes from the government. Uh, and in the case of the US, the only, uh, I mean, one of the beautiful things that I see here as a performing artist here is people are willing to support you as an independent artist. It's beautiful. And I always put the same example, like when I perform in your city with my jazz quartet, uh, the usual is that I send the email to whatever my community, right? And then some people will tell me, oh, we can't go to Jazz Standard this week, but we are happy to invite some friends and buy the tickets for them so we can support you, right? And maybe the example in Galicia or in Spain or in some other European countries could be, I am performing in this place. Uh, I just wanted to let you know. And the answer would be, oh, would you send me some tickets? Is it possible just to give me a, a few tickets for free, right? And that's that's just two different ways of understanding the relationship with the, with the audience. And I think if we look at that particular economic relationship uh, from top to bottom, we may we may make the same mistakes we are already making in both systems. Like what is the relationship that we need is to look from, from the audience to the artist and then from the artist to the providers. Right. Yeah, we're able to turn to the sciences, which is uh, very government funded by NIH. Um, I know we had a Sunil from NEA here for our more previous discussion. So the model for um, scientific labs is those that have, uh, I would say, the scientific breakthroughs, the most advances have been made, or all those, uh, or either a specific type of cancer or disease that um, the NIH had taken special interest in, or some institutions that have received um, a dispropor disproportionately large um, grant. So I'm just, I'm not sure if that similar type of um, thing may happen to the arts once, whether it's going to be very centralized or it could be particular orchestra, particular geographic locations that may receive uh, most of the funding versus smaller organizations. Um, so now we will return to another audience question. Um, we have someone asked, um, what are some, so all of you have participated in some type of um, virtual programming. Sebastian, you've created a teaching website and you've all performed virtually in different contexts. So um, this anonymous um, viewer asked, what are some positive outcomes of a year of virtual programming that you or your organizations might carry over as we move to more in-person programming and concerts? Um, and then would you like to start us off on the question? Oh, did you hear the question? Sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, positive out outcomes um, of a year of virtual programming that you um, um, may want to carry over and, and extend once things return to a semblance of normalcy. Yes, yes. Um, as, a, as an opera singer, I don't program a lot, but one thing that uh, is a positive outcome for me is to program more uh, concerts, uh, more uh, uh, chamber music, and um, more uh, small scale um, uh, programs that would have a, a be, uh, that would have more intimate uh, audience because um, it felt very intimate to do it virtually, and it felt very good to sing for only ten people who who absolutely love it and. It, I think um, for me, that would be the a positive outcome to sing more chamber concerts and um, yeah. Wonderful. Um, anything, Sebastian, would you like to share? Um, I, I think we learned big lessons from, from the live streaming. Um, also in terms of quality, um, people in the beginning weren't aware of it. They were just putting stuff out and thought, the world needs to hear this until they realized that was just like the world did want to hear it. Um, because once you're out in the internet, you're also competing with people that died 50 years ago. You know, life doesn't really mean something so much. I think we a lot of orchestras started learning really how to play for mics 
and the mics are very unforgivable, much more unforgivable than than an audience in a live uh, uh, setting. So it's a disciplinary thing. But I think what we need to keep, though, is that live streaming, I think, from now on will be an add-on to live performance, but it won't replace it. It can be an add-on, but when we do it, we have to do it really, really well. And, and all the small organizations have to invest to, into it a little bit better to make it a really good experience. Um, I think all organizations learn these lessons. I agree. And uh, as we as artists can testify, and I'm sure audience as well, you know, the just recorded or virtual live music does not give us a rush of endorphin, endorphins, a rush of joy. No. The same way uh, <laughs> connecting with a live audience in a concert hall can ever be. So we are looking very much look, looking forward to returning. And I want to thank you again, St. Sebastian, Mane, and Christina for joining us today. Thank you for sharing uh, with us your very personal stories, your triumphs, your struggles. And I want to thank uh, Anya and thank Suhei, thank Music Bridges around the world for organizing this wonderful event. So now I'll thank you. Thank you. thank you, May, for moderating this session. And again, to Sebastian, Mane, and Christina for joining us. You know, as an organization, Musical Bridges, we really we really took advantage of this opportunity to program virtually. Our audiences are typically in San Antonio and in the European style, many, much of our programming is free. But what we found is we expanded beyond Bear County, beyond Texas, the nation and the globe. And so many of you are tuning in from places where you might not typically be able to attend the International Music Festival. So it's been a boon to us and we hope to continue this hybrid format as we return to live programming as well in the fall. And thanks for referencing that first panel. We did have that conversation of what both Christina and Sebastian mentioned about the future of how the arts are perceived and certainly how they're supported by government and private agencies. So we're thrilled that you are taking the time to join us all the way from New York, Christina, and Berlin, Mane, and off of the coast, Sebastian, before you leave for Hungary tomorrow. So, and Mane, what we have coming up next, you may have wished that you started at the start of the pandemic, but you can join us now for some chair yoga. And we know that May is also a yoga teacher, but we move into our next session of chair yoga. And we thank all of our panelists for joining us. Welcome to join us for the rest of the Summit and International Music Festival. So from all of us at Musical Bridges, thank you. So to our audiences, we move now and we begin with our breath. We turn our palms up and we can place them on our knees as we place our feet flat on the floor, close our eyes, roll our shoulders back as we inhale, exhaling, releasing our shoulders down. Through all the activity of the day, we're sometimes stuck at our computer, at our desk, it's just nice to be able to recenter, take account of our breath, of our blessings, and reset for the afternoon. Inhaling, we take another deep breath rooted at the base of the spine, growing tall as we lift the shoulders to our ears. And exhaling, releasing the shoulders down. Deep inhale, we count one, two, three. Now pausing at the top of that breath and then exhaling, three, two, one. We pause at the bottom of that breath, inhaling one, two, three, Pausing, exhaling, three, two, one, and pause, in, two, three, pause, Two, one. 
gently opening our eyes. We can place the palms of our hands down on the thighs. Once again, as we roll our shoulders back, this time we lift the chest. Maybe taking our head back slightly. And then exhaling, rolling our shoulders forward as we round our spine, dropping our head forward. Inhaling, opening the chest, shoulders roll back. Exhaling, rounding forward. Inhaling. And exhaling. On the next inhale, we roll our shoulders back up and down. As we take our hands, extending the arms out, intertwining our fingers, pressing the palms forward. As we inhale, lifting the arms up. And exhaling forward. Inhaling. Pressing forward and up. Pausing here for a full breath. And taking a gentle twist over to the right. Keeping our fingers bound. Inhaling, extending palms and arms to the sky. And exhaling, gentle twist to the other side. Inhaling back to center. And as we exhale, we take our right arm behind us to the back of our chair as we take our left arm over to our leg or the arm of the chair, and then inhaling, lifting again from the base of our spine, and then exhaling, turning our head to look over the right shoulder. Exhaling, releasing, extending both arms overhead and exhaling to the other side. Left arm behind us, right arm to the leg or chair side, inhaling, growing tall, and exhaling, gentle twist, just looking over the shoulder. Inhaling back to center, extending the arms up. And exhaling hands through heart center as we release them. Now lifting our right leg, we cross it over the left and taking our ankle just over the thigh. You can't see my legs under the desk, but some of you may be at a desk and that's okay. As long as you can lift that leg up, cross ankle over the thigh, inhaling, rolling the shoulders back and then exhaling just bowing forward, and we all have different limits in our flexibility, so wherever you feel the stretch, that's where you can pause. Maybe taking one more breath, glowing slightly deeper. Inhaling, we rise, and then exhaling, we release that leg, back, putting the foot flat on the floor, lifting the opposite leg, crossing ankle over knee, and then exhaling, gently folding forward. Taking one more breath and maybe going slightly deeper on the exhale. Inhaling back to upright. And now taking our left arm behind our back and seeing if we can take our right hand, intertwining it with the fingers of the other hand. And then taking our right ear, gently dropping it over to the right shoulder. Making a nice stretch in the side of the neck. Just taking a few breaths. Mm -hmm. 
releasing that bind and switching sides, crossing the right arm behind us and taking the left arm to intertwine the fingers and very gently dropping the left ear down. Releasing the bind as we inhale both arms overhead. And as we exhale, we cross our right arm underneath the left and seeing if we can take either the wrist or maybe intertwine the fingers, taking the palm. These are called eagle arms in yoga. And then we gently begin to drop the elbows. It's going to be a nice upper back stretch. Maybe tucking the chin. Inhaling, lifting, and releasing that cross. Inhaling the arms out. And exhaling, opposite arm under. Seeing if we can connect our palms or intertwine our fingers. We lift the elbows up. And exhaling, drawing them in. Maybe tucking our chin. Inhaling, rising. And then taking our arms like cactus out to the side. Opening the heart. Extending the arms up. Our palms connect. And exhaling, we return hands to heart center. As we bow to the light within ourselves. And within each other. And the Sanskrit is namaste for that. So maybe you've never tried yoga before. And it's just the combination. It's the union of movement of mind and body. So many of us stuck at home for work and not moving about town, running around. This is an opportunity just to have a short break in between your work day where you can breathe Recenter yourself, stretch out a little bit, and center the mind before the rest of the day. So hopefully our short chair yoga, and it requires nothing but a chair, and I simply took off my jacket. There was no change of clothes, but just a nice way to reconnect with ourselves before we continue with the rest of our day. So thank you for joining us for chair yoga.